Christian the West Indies, two part two. Now I am going to introduce you to our moderator, very esteemed individual filmmaker, head of the film department of the University of the West Indies. And then he is going to introduce us. And I'm, I'm opening, I'm the, I'm the muse, the Creole muse from St. Lucia. Ay, 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 mama, I love Ay, 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 mama, I love Ay, 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 mama, I love See no papi, no caimo. Ay, 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 mama, I love Ay, 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 mama, I love Ay, 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 mama, I love See no papi, no caimo. Thank you very much. I'll tell you about this later. Over to Mr. Ramasa. <laughs> thank you so much, Travis. Um, for in, for, and thank you for convening such an illustrious panel. You know, we call it a power, power, power panel. And Creole forms and Caribbean performance. We got um, Roald Givens, who, who for years held the Creative Arts, which is now DCFA at the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine. And of course, Steam Playwright. We have Pearl Aintu Springer, goes by one name when we reach that stage, Aintu, who I see listed as a poet, but of, as a playwright, but we have, she's poet laureate. She's got her, she did the doctorate, the lit at UTT, um, the annual um, ritual now for the reenactment of Canberley and on and on and on. And I'll be here all night. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we have Emily Sahakian and she is a Creole scholar out of the University of Georgia. We have um, Christo Adonis, who is listed here as a Creole lecturer, but I know him as, as a shaman of the indigenous people, to carry people of Trinidad and Tobago, and um, a, a spirit leader as such. And finally, um, we have you, Travis. Mr. Travis Weeks, uh, Dr. Travis Weeks. He's a STEAM solution playwright and um, lecturer, of course, at the DCFA in St. Augustine. So folks, I wanna kick this off. Now let's be kind of relaxed about this, especially in these times. I just wanna throw out a little question, a couple of thoughts before stepping out of the way. So we are in a particular period. I wanna to, 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 to immediately um, deal with the elephant in the room perhaps, but we are in a particular time a Creole performance has been stymied or still by the hand of nature, the gods, man. And in the case of Trinidad, for instance, just a good instance, Trinidad and Tobago, the performance, the Creole performance, it was carnival. It's, we love, there was no carnival last year. And, we, and we have this looming, I'm getting chills right now because we have this looming question about whether this is going to happen again. Imagine two years and the performance of Carnival, so central to the cultural existence, psychic existence of the people, is again stayed by this thing called COVID. And I want to hop back, and as I, I talked about um, Aintu, who does the Campbell reenactment every year, annually, stuff like that, um, in, interestingly, coming out of the banning of the drum, we're talking about the innovations that, that the band of the drum um, gave rise to tambu bamboo and then bamboo to steel and all of these things. So I just want to throw it out here. I want to just, to, of course, to reference what, what we're talking about here with Creole and performance. And also, where do we go from here? Or is there a chance that out of this crucible of pandemic and um, stillness, there will be a syncretism of sorts of some sort of rebirth or rediscovery arising from these ashes of all of them. It's like the mountains have been stilled. And over to who now? Who should we like to, 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 to kick it off? Travis, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks a million. Yeah, I, yeah, I, um, I, I will. Um, yeah, that, yeah, this is very, very important. You know, I like the way you, you started off because, um, you know, Creole forms are, are so much about, about agency, so much about, about mobility and so much about um, syncretism. So, yeah, I mean, 
I like I like the fact that you're making it relevant to what's happening now to our contemporary situation because certainly I think you know that's part of our challenge of of seeing how we can um, group together despite whatever differences um, to tackle you know this, the current issues that are facing us. But let's let's go a little to the genesis you know of of Creole forms and um, I want to share you know my own experience so that I can you know share as well uh, my understanding. Of what cool forms are. I find that uh, you know it, the, the whole issue sometimes could be very blurred and, and, and shaky, and um, and that's okay because of because I mean inherent in the, in the term and the concept is diversity, so um, so that that is fine. But so I think our own experiences are, are, are important, and um, so I'm so I'm, I'm taking you back to Saint Lucia, and to me as a boy in Saint Lucia. Um, in order to understand how what I see as cruel forms. And you know, when I thought that song I sang, that um, these lines I sang earlier was taken from the, the Laros Festival. And as a boy, I remember, you know, being astounded because growing up and, and standing in the city and um, you know, seeing these busloads of peasants passing, very colorful, and you just hear the songs. And it's almost fleeting because they just pass through um, the street and you hear the songs and you hear all the music, you know, and, and they're gone. And then as a boy, you fall to see where they're going, and then you realize that they were heading to Columbus Square. That was the, term, the name at the time before it was renamed the Republic Square. So they, they're heading to um, Columbus, I'm talking like in the 70s, you know, um, to Columbus Square, where now they would be performing through the, the political um, um, administratives and the hierarchy and the, and, the, and the elite and so on. And these peasants would be performing for them. Um, now the interesting thing about the about the Laos festival and the Creole forms is that they were coming and they were mimicking, if you like, all those persons who occupy the statuses of, of, of hierarchy in the society. So kings, queens, magistrates, doctors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the policemen, the, the the face of authority. So you had these peasants who were costumed in in, in 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 you know in those occupations, if you like. And they were performing in, in Columbus Square before the hierarchy. Now these were peasants who they were peasants. They were farmers. They were so they were not any of these. They were not magistrates. They were not uh, whatever. Uh, of course, their grandchildren and great grandchildren are now occupied those positions. But but they were not able to access. They they couldn't reach there. They were just peasants. So in terms of mimicry, they were coming into the space and they were mimicking those persons in the hierarchy. So. Um, so, but what what is what is very important is the fact that the festival was was a masking, yeah. It was a masking because what I realized later when I started to do research was that in preparation for the festival, those peasants grouped in the rural community, in the hills and so on, where they came from, you know, their their, their habitats, and the now it's interesting because they colonizers, the French colonizers call it sciences. And they spent nights, you know, engaging and practicing the, 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 the culture. Uh, so they, they would they spend nights drumming and dancing and singing and storytelling and giving jokes and all, all those, uh, you know, all those moods and so on. Um, and so what, so the culmination and raising funds while they did this as well, and, 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 and bonding and grouping, you know, and solidifying their own identity and, and, and being a team. And so the, the festival on the day, uh, which have been August 30th and so on, um, was when they came dressed in all the finery and so on, and masking and then performing on Columbus Square and being invited to government house and being invited to places that they would not normally have any access to, right? So, okay, so, so wh why, why are they Creole? Why are they Creole forms? For me, they're Creole forms because they, they were engaging you, you had people, peasants, descendants of Africans, who were engaging the colonial power and who were using um, aesthetic uh, modes of, of presentation in order to, en in order to engage the, 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 the powers of the day. They were using art to do it. Um, what makes it cruel is that they were bringing their own um, cultural resources, yeah, as descendants of Africans, they will bring in that to the 
the, the cultural practices of the colonizers. And by cultural practices of the colonizers, I'm talking about the culture, the, 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 the music of the colonizers, the, the occupations, the modes of dress, the demeanor, the behavior, they were bringing that, right? Uh, so we know that they were themselves, fully themselves, um, when they are preparing for the festival, when they in the what they what they would call seances and when they were practicing their arts, we know that. So what so what you have you had through this engagement um, was was a transformation. You you had you had the creation of novel forms, Caribbean forms, forms newly formed, form developed on the soil, but with the cultural resources of, of these descendants of Africans that they, that they kept with them and they kept practicing but now engaging the, the colonial power in a way uh, that is agentive and that would afford them the kind of mobility where they could now penetrate the colonial spaces, yeah? And transform those spaces that were, that were otherwise um, inaccessible to them where they, they were not, so, so they could reach those places now and have a space of comfort and actually have an audience with the governor general or government, not governor general at the time, uh, that's before independence, right? But wherever it was, wherever was the head of states, queen's representatives and representatives and queen's councils and whatever, 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 whatever. Okay, so, so yeah, so for me, these, these are what the creole forms. And I mentioned the Laos Festival. We also had the La Madrid Festival, which was similar. And then we had the masquerade, yeah? We had the masquerade um, forms where we had, um, again, on Columbus Square, we had masquerade performers dressed as they did, as you know, um, from the Egungun ancestry, yeah, uh, you know, in terms of the headdress and the costume and so on, and and, and the drumming and so on, on the on the edge of Columbus Square, where they had, we had an annual fair every year um, to welcome the new year, and and so you had them performing, but they were engaging the colonial power because they were because they were on the periphery, they were not they were not um, um, established and, and formally invited to perform. But they, but they came in and how did they come? Their music, yeah? The music assisted greatly in terms of mobility because what they were using was the, the kettle drum, yeah? Now we know how the kettle drum was used by the colonizers, the British colonizers in terms of uh, um, signaling the power, literally. You know, when, they, when they're marching, the military marches and parades and so on to really uh, demonstrate the control and power. Uh, in, in the city, in the colonial city. Um, but you had these masquerades as, as well using the kettle drum, but using a fife and using the other drums and using their chants, yeah? And so you, so as a boy, you hear, you hear, you hear, once you hear this, you hear. And, and you had a kettle drum rattling, and these were the masquerades on the periphery doing this. And again, what they were doing, which was very political, was they were not only encroaching, but they were beginning to claim their rights to this peace in the colonial city, in the city center. And so again, these are Creole forms. And so we have numerous examples. We have the Papa Jab, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we're talking about the, and you know how the colonial city is organized, where you have the big Roman Catholic church, and you have the square, and you have the police station, and the jail is not too far away, and the parliament is not too far away, and all of that are demonstrations of the colonial power and their control, right? So, really and truly, what our people developed was some uh, um, performative modes uh, that were very dynamic. That were very aesthetic and artistic, and 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 which they use for agency in order to break a lot of the, the boundaries and cultural barriers and political barriers, and in so doing, creating novel forms out of what they had and what they had to come up against. Um, you know, and I have a, a short video clip on on the Laros Festival. Um, that I would like, um, perhaps, that we can we can look at it. Then it will give some indication um, about what I'm talking about, you know, and 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 the fact that you know that these performances had to happen there in the centers of power by Columbus Square, by the church, 
were very, 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 very uh, significant. Yeah, and um, after another imp important aspect of, of, of the creolization processes and the whole idea of creole forms um, is the fact that we had the influx of the liberated Africans, yeah, that came around the 1850s, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they came to strengthen, well, they didn't come to do that, they were brought to work, but the impact of their presence strengthened the, the resolve of the, of the formerly enslaved uh, to penetrate those colonial species and, and work at some kind of transformation. Um, right, so, but I am suggesting that those Creole forms that developed early in the process of colonization on the plantation, et cetera, or, or side, on the sides of the plantation in the hills and so on, um, that they were, the, their formation guaranteed a type of, um, uh, you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking engine, you know, I'm thinking um, some kind of tuning. In other words, they, they established some dynamics that when other peoples came, whether it be the, the, the liberated Africans or the East Indians and so on, when they came, they came into those forms and those forms were already so powerful that, that they just added to it and strengthened it. Because I mean, the, the element of, of, of course, of, of, of oppression um, of, of haves and have nots is an important dynamic because people who are newly coming in and coming in to be uh, as, as servants or as, as, you know, just a little more than slaves and so on, will fit into, into aesthetic and political dynamics that would allow them mobility, social mobility, and would give them political, political power. Uh, so this is the, the, when you think about Creole forms, that, that is my perspective that I wanted to share. And um, I don't know if we can get, if we get some of the, the clips that I have there, um, that would be great. Then we can see some of, of those. Um, yeah, so this greatly influenced me as a playwright. Um, and, and it is because as well, as those before me, I mean, Roderick Walcott, for example, were very early with taking the flower festivals and putting them into theater. And, and I'm sure that a lot of us would know the stories of the Banjo Man. I mean, the, the kind of, um, you know, hostility, that, that difficulties that the Banjo Man when, when Roger Walcott uh, used the, 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 the La Rose Festival in, in the Banjo Man. I mean, the church authorities, et cetera, you know, were, were you know, putting pressure on him and so on. And he had some issues just getting it done. Eventually, it went to the first Sky Festival in Guyana. Uh, but it is because, Again, um, the prejud there were the prejudices against those those cultural forms, those cultural forms, because it was recognized by the authorities the effect and the impact that they were having uh, on the society, and so so and, and Roger will continue to do that with Chanson Marianne, and he used other the other forms that existed. Of course, we know. I mean, the world knows about Derek making use of the forms, the Papa Jab, Patricia, and his brothers, and and also the court, yeah, the court, which was a, a, a cultural form that developed uh, when they marked or they grieved for the passing of somebody in the community, a family member, etc. And the court was a, a narrative uh, that involved uh, storytelling, riddles, and jokes, and dances, etc. And that really um, helped inform. Um, well, he was conscious in terms of what he was doing with his craft. But you know the early plays like Malcochon and 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 Dauphin, et cetera, experimentation and Tisha, and to a certain extent, um, 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 Dream as well. And I think he went on in terms of you know syncretizing the form with um, the other Western influences, etc., from from Europe. Um, but yeah, so as a playwright, this is what influenced me. That's what I was coming with. Yeah, um, Kion, are you here with me? Yeah, and so. When I um, began to write, um, 
And if you think of a place, for example, like the Field of Power, the Fight for Bellevue, that we've just, and we've just did a film adaptation. We did a film, film adaptation of the Fight for Bellevue. Um, it's just out, really, but we did it some time ago. Um, I used the, the Kele ceremony, which was a ceremony that was a ritual that was banned by the church. And there was a lot of hostility uh, you know, against the practitioners of the, the Kele ritual. Yeah, but bringing in the Kele ritual because of its, its performative potential or its potential for theater, but also because, it, you know, by rooting the theater in, in those Creole forms of the people, uh, one is also uh, continuing the whole process of challenging um, certain authorities, certain powers, uh, and, and their prejudices, um, etc. So yeah, so that is my my experience when it comes to my, my, the, the perspective that has that I have developed as regards uh, Creole forms and how these Creole forms uh, are so important to Caribbean um, performance. Right. Um, if you look here, thanks, Kion. Yeah, we can see that this is from the Pied Fight of Bellevue, and this was done um, with students, my drama class at the South Louis Community College um, some years ago. And, and here you see, this is the high priest, the Kelly high priest there, um, who has created his altar and who is engaging in the ritual. But he is torn, um, the character, who's trying to keep his, his land from being stolen, so, you know, literally. Uh, but in terms of the theatrical possibilities, you see the dancers and, and the formations there that are happening because the ritual was, was indeed was a celebration. It was paid homage to Ogud and Shangmu for a good harvest, etc. cetera, right? Um, but the space allowed, the ritual allowed for the drumming, for the dancing, and, 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 and for, for the prayers, and for the chants, et cetera. Um, so immense possibilities for theater, very, very theatrical. And I had some really good choreographers. I had Richard Ambrose and I had um, Leo Amede, who was working with, um, with, the, with the dancers and, and, and getting the ballet out of them. And, and, and so, yeah, that is another important thing of using the forms because by using the forms, we, we are also perpetuating and encouraging the use of the indigenous dances, yeah? Uh, because these, these dances, they are part of the rituals. They are, they are necessary, they're inherent, they're integral to the, to the rituals. And so when we continue to use the forms, we also make way for a continuation of the, of the, of the, of the drummers, of the knowledge of the, of the tones and the beats and so on. Uh, we make way for, for the, for the development of, of choreographers who learn from, from those before. Because what I had, I had a, a, a neat collaboration between Richard and Leo, um, where they were learning from each other, uh, right? And, and, and so we, we keep, when we keep doing that, we guarantee the continuation yeah, of, of our of folk cultural practices that came through generations. And so we pass them on to things. And, and so that's why I've, I've been immensely grateful for the work that has been done by, by, by CXC, uh, you know, and people, and, and I'm glad that Roel is with us, uh, you know, in, in terms of insisting and encouraging that students um, use the cultural forms in their play making, um, in the practice of their, of their own work. Um, so, yeah, um, so yeah, I, yeah, I, you know, this is the kind of uh, um, perspective that I would like to share as regards the Creole forms and Caribbean and Caribbean performance, because very significantly, it is, it is where we find our uniqueness. And of course, the literary people like me and the playwrights, I mean, we articulate it and in academia, we articulate it and we share and we train our people. And being at the CFP, I've seen how much um, Louis and the others are working in terms of continuing to share the importance of using our rituals and our, 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 our festivals. Um, however, but I, it's important for us, and we all know that the folk in their communities, on their streets, etc., they are the ones who have been, who have been 
using these Creole forms for, for, for political, for political purposes, to always challenge the, the, the establishment and create towards creating a leveling now, a leveling ground. Uh, you know, in our, when you examine our societies, it seems to me that it's the Creole forms, and now you, you were talking about earlier about, you know, bringing us together. You look at our societies and you realize that it's the Creole forms that creates a leveling ground. Many other ethnicities and, and so on would love to just stay in the corner and, and, and be and keep everyone out. But the Creole forms, the agentive qualities of Creole forms, is, is going in and, and taking elements of, of, of dominant discourses and representing um, them, you know, with added qualities that creates inroads and that brings more people in, you know, and of course, Carnival is a big, the biggest exponent and example of all that, uh, you know, bringing everyone in and creating a common space and, and, and a society where, uh, you know, at least there is there is constant exchange, yeah. So I don't. That's why I don't like the the, the, the perspectives of Creole that is a kind of nice happy mix. It's not a nice happy mix. It is very dynamic. There are constant dynamics there. There's always there's always change. But however, what it does is that it brings it engages everyone and brings everyone to share and to exchange. And it brings everyone in dialogue. And so. And, and Trinidad is a lovely place to examine creolization when you see what is happening with, 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 with the, the, the Indian music and, 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 and the African music, et cetera, et cetera. It's wonderful when you see that constant engagement that is happening. But we owe it to the Creole forms and to the early, to the, mm -hmm. the, to the, to the, to the plantation, to the, those who are on the plantation who did not give up, did not cower before the might, did not die. And that is what the Laro song says. If we don't move, if we don't budge, if we don't bustle, if we will die. Yeah. Right? And so, so, so we owe it to those early people who developed the Creole forms, who are not willing to die, it doesn't matter how many guns or whips or whatever that was facing them, and who, who you use their art to engage the colonial cultural practices and created agency and mobility. And that is what we have in the Caribbean up till now. Mm -hmm. and, and that is what the world has to look to the Caribbean and respect the Caribbean for the way we've been able to bring, and we continue to bring everyone in, in that circle. I'd love to go to Ayn too, right on that note, because I want to share a little bit about the performance of resistance or the resistance of performance, her reenactment of Canberley, the assumption of that space for the reenactment, the you push back against the plantation and the colonial regimes. Yeah. And I just want to hear about that and also a little bit if possible about what is hap what happens, what does she foresee in terms of what, what has this generated? This, as I said, this the state of carnival, what has it generated? Because let's just jump to, to Rena Rama, um, the road march by Kitchener as a response to, to, to polio, uh, 1973, I think, bro, tell me what's wrong. <laughs> but um, in terms of um, Carnival being postponed until until into rainy season when and then it rained on the parade, you know. And of course, Kitchener came up with a wonderful road march based on you know mass in May, you know. So what arises from 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 I would first of all I want to hear about that assumption of space because that is an annual thing that's also important because that that that's a particular signature signification and 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 and, and um, capturing of real estate and space and imagination and spirit and, and you know, every year. So there's no going back as such, although it has been stayed for a year now. So I, I just love to know about, <laughs> for us to know about that process and that manifestation of yours. Okay. Um, I, I am very conflicted about this, this creolization thing. 
Mm. I have a lot of problems with it. We have given so much, so much, but the cultural forms that we have given are still marginalized. I am not interested in transforming anything or anybody. What has come, I want to enrich me, my children. The pan that has come out of Lavantil has not helped Lavantil. The Kaiso is still marginalized. I am interested, I was taught that through art, through our cultural forms, that is critical for resistance, for transformation, for self. For me, for my children, my grandchildren, from all them cockroaches in Lavantil and all of that. I am not, I think that, um, I remember some years ago, Roll pointing out to me in his very clear way that what we have retained was kept by us in whatever form that it was kept. And we have to recognize that and build on it. And I heard Travis talk about syncretization. And I recognize that that was an important process and period. But it's time to prize off the mask. It's time to prize off the mask and reveal me. You know, Leroy says a very, interesting thing and um, he talks about the fact that as artists we go into our mother's womb and take out our rhythms and sell them in the marketplace without giving her recognition and visibility of the carnival he says we must the carnival and all these things disturb me. Let me go back to the beginning. I mwesoti Santa Cruz. I come out of there. And as a child growing up, if, that, if there was paradise, that was paradise. But in terms of material things, we were extremely poor. But we had almost every cultural form existing. Behind the rum shop was a gael. I had a grandfather who was from St. Vincent with that um, Garifuna link. I had another grandfather who come from Venezuela but who land in a Patwa peace speaking place and he named turn Tija. We had the, the Param, people making serenal from Levanta to Despedida. And all these forms, and then of course, um, Santa Cruz was set up as a place for First Peoples when they were, um, <laughs> when they were taken off the, those labor camps called encomiendas, when they were escaped or, or were given freedom, they went to Santa Cruz and um, they, they were not supposed to mix with the enslaved Africans. But of course, Santa Cruz developed as a place of strong first peoples, strong African. I still remember my Wara roots, my father and they coming from Santa Cruz in that zigzag procession down the sound were all, all, all the words which I would not try to replicate now. So it was all this richness, all the, 
all the special foods, all the wonderful things. But outside of that cocoon, that security, what were you? You were nothing and nobody in the society. When you went to school, you had to hide the food that was so precious. All your cultural forms were marginalized, but exotic. And I really could not understand it. And it bothered me, bothered me, bothered me until in secondary school, I was introduced to the writings of C.L. James and Larry Constantine. It was an aha moment for me. So, and then joining the library and being pushed because I had no desk present, they said, meaning I, I, I was black and didn't wear linen suits. They put me in the corner with all the Caribbean books. And I read and read and read, and of course, 69, Black Power, 1970, Black Power Revolution. But in that time, I had become a member of Derek Walcott's theater company and Slade Hopkins had been my mentor. So I developed an understanding that theater and the arts that was the way to transform our position, to force ourselves and give recognition and visibility and a sense of self. So the first scripts I ever wrote was part of those huge rallies that we used to have in the, in the, in the 70s. And I was able to see the power of of presentation. I, sh I should say something else about Santa Cruz. There was, there was storytelling sessions and the storytelling sessions were mostly held in Patua. So a lot of the lessons I learned from life were in Patua because I used to ask a lot of questions, you know, Petit cochon, di grand cochon, comme assez bouche long, grand cochon, di petit cochon, tanto, tanto. You know, little hog asks big hog, why your mouth so long? Big hog tell little hog, bye bye, you go, you go see him. You know, um, Anansi Len, goat, clothes, and all of that. He going to get married. And goat, Duck, I'm sorry, Len Duck. And Duck, I'm grateful, put a Nancy under the table. And a Nancy calling out, cause he lent him all this clothes. Come back, Anna, come back, Anna, Bamwe, Saki, Slamwe. All the lessons about gratitude, about they were in Patwa. So I come now and I'm writing these scripts. And just a little example. We in Belmont, Royal Gibbons place, Freetown, and um, I'm writing these scripts on the road. And we got a brother to play Randy Burroughs had just killed some more of our children. So the, the Belmont Community Center is packed and the brother who was killed was called Santa Cruz and I got his wife to play herself and, um, and the brother who was playing um, Ronnie Burroughs was very dour and he didn't have no time to do no set of training, so he typecasting in a way. And as he started to speak as a policeman, it is my duty to, and as he did that, the crowd just started to move. And I had to run on stage. And another example, putting on street theater, we did Eric Roach's um, tribute to Butler. And as we know, Charlie, Charlie King, the policeman was killed. So we threw the flambeau and all of that. The next day, 
The next night, which was Christmas Eve, my house was raided. My mother had a, a, a nervous breakdown. So I, I have lived and I know the power of that, of, of theater. So then you come to the heartbeat, the heartbeat of the thing, the carnival of which Leroy Helgen has said, we must be a carnival. We must be a carnival. Tony Hall and um, John Cupid, and they started the Cambule in around 2000. And um, it was really a reenactment. And I looked at it and I said, I want to go beyond the reenactment. I want to examine the lives of the people who confronted the police the British Regiment in 1881 and create their story. And so Kambule was born out of that. And of course, the people at the time, Patwa was what they spoke. So the, the play is heavily infused with the Patwa, especially, you know, when it's, it's 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 all it's all true the the play and um you know we use the forms the indigenous forms linking straight back to the masking traditions of the motherland the damlerin ball based on the gelede masquerade of the Yoruba people and, and so on. So that, that play was set up to reclaim the carnival because the carnival had descended into bikini and beads and the African was almost excluded from the mass, the traditional masquerade, most of them dying out and all of that. People not understanding that carnival, the mere existence of carnival was an act of superb resistance. And that in all the resistance, the spirituality, the spirituality was there. There was never any resistance without the spirituality. And Obia, the, the Akan spirituality that was so critical to our emancipation, the Obia, that is still one of the most hated words in the lexicon, although it is, it is that is diminishing. So what I have tried to do, apart from the storytelling, which to me is critical, is to develop rituals, rituals that would seek to give sense of self, to elevate our own version of ourselves. And the Kambule is one to let us know that we fought for something that we could claim this carnival, you know, because the way is very painful now. Carnival seems to have retrogressed to the point where, you know, there was a time Hollis Liverpool talks about two carnival, the carnival of the elite being played on, on, on trucks and so on, their mass balls, and the carnival of the people which were African. Now you're, you're seeing young, light-colored women in the bands with big black burly men with the ropes protecting them, you know. I've tried to create three rituals. One is the Kambule. The other one is a very important one called Freedom Morning Come, which talks about 
um, the first emancipation morning. And there the people, the people were there, Padre Cesar, Padre Cesar, because they wanted to introduce a period of indentureship of six, of six years. The people resisted, they were forced to reduce it to four. There were riots in, in Port of Spain for a whole week, so nobody did, nobody gave us emancipation. It was fought for. If I want to share anything, I want to share, because whatever we do as a Caribbean people, our forms, our beings will never have full recognition until we deal with the question of IET. IET as the mother of our civilization has to be part of that consciousness. So let me, let me in, in Freedom Morning Come, which is the ritual to our emancipation and that struggle, um, five, about five enslaved Africans come together and they are talking about their experiences. And there's one, there's one who is Haitian, he's called Francois Tombi. And let me see if I could find Yes, because I'm looking in, in the wrong place. I'm looking in Kambule. And this is really Freedom Morning Come. So we have this character who is called Francois Tongue. As we know in Trinidad and Tobago, a lot of Haitians, a lot of slave these enslavers came, ran from Haiti to Trinidad with the enslaved Africans. And Francois Tombi speaks. He says, you forget, écoute moi bien, listen Francois Tombi well. My father bring me small from Haiti. He come with the Bakra who run from we country, run from Haiti people. Run from the power we voodoo. Run from the revolution. We is the people who make road for everybody to see a day like today. We play Legba for two moon. The Bokwa run from Toussaint, Desaline, Christophe, and we great Papa Loa, Macandal, and Bookman. Was there in my father country? that black man take his freedom and start to shake up the Caribbean. Dimwe, ukakone, all you know that tout, nom d'Afrik, all black man from Africa, free, free, they put their foot land in Haiti, and Haiti soil, mwe, nom d'Haiti, nom de voodoo. So that is, a second ritual that I try to do. So the ritual among the carnival, celebrating our heroes, making us claim the carnival as ours, the ritual around emancipation. And I do something for the first peoples as well, Hirema, a play which celebrates the, the first people. So I think let me I talk, I talk enough. Let me hush now, unless think, there are any questions. I think um, you have a, a, something lined up with Can okay, so from Canberra. Um, just a, to, to say, I think, um, I think is Nudwenya Masla, which is uh, my weak Creole, um, Haitian Creole, for we must remove the mask, which I think is something that resonated from you said, first of all, right? Retirila Masla, remove the mask, the mask. Rise it off. Yeah, well, pluck it then. 
Right. And I see, so it's not just remove or take off, but, but I got it, it was tear off the mask. Right. right. Cool. Yeah. So that's something I got that, that resonated with me earlier clock. I think that we have something from Kambule, um lined up here to yes. show. The, the Dame Lorraine ball. Yeah. Where the Mets Le Col, um, well, we will, we will, we will see. And this is based on the, the Gilladale masquerade. Maestro. Woman can study danger when it's time to fight. Look. Still. The Jamet Yard is the cradle of rebellion. Crucible of creativity mm -hmm. yes. for the African. Yes. Mm -hmm. From there came the manima of Mark in a mm -hmm. space. Yes. A cocoon of ferment. Mm -hmm. A power base. Mm -hmm. At carnival time was the Gael bold. Must come to and yeah. Kai so stronghold, stronghold. Mm -hmm. and, and the, the damn Lorraine's ball yeah. <laughs> yeah. with such pomp oh God, look and that. ceremony, ceremony. Uh -huh. <laughs> mocks those in high, high society. Uh -huh. Madame Jenny! 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 Madame
okay. Thank you. I'd like to introduce um, Emily Sakian um, to kick off the next um, rounds. Thank you. you hear me? Yeah, thank you, Yao. Um, I, I want to thank Dr. Travis Weeks for this invitation. I'm really honored to be among these esteemed panelists. Um, a lot of the things that Travis said resonated with me, and um, I'm really inspired and humbled to hear Dr. Pearl Ingtu Springer um, talk um, about these forceful political messages um, and share this wisdom. So um, I also wanna thank um, Keon Reed for improvising with me. I just got a new computer and I'm having some difficulties. So I prepared a presentation. We're going to go ahead and start now, if we can start sharing the screen and I'll just let you know, Keon, when um, it's time to switch to the next slide. Hopefully you all will be able to see it. The title of this presentation is Staging Creolization, Reactivating Gwoka's History Through Lena Blue's Contemporary Caribbean Performance. I can't see the presentation, but can you see it? Oops. Oh, here it comes. Um, Travis, I I was really happy to hear you um, talk about the Lewos Festival because Lewos is one of the seven rhythms of Guoka. And in fact, it is the rhythm that expresses the soul of the people. Um, so I'm expanding on my book where I talk about staging creolization and sharing some new research with you all um, in which I continue to think about what it means to stage creolization. So if we can go to the first slide. Guoka is a performance tradition involving drumming, dancing and singing and the privileged cultural heritage of the island in the French West Indies, Guadeloupe. At the time of slavery, Guoka was suppressed by the white planter class for fear of its potential to spark revolt. Wolka has maintained its role as a space of resistance, and it's one of the most prevalent symbols of Guadalupean identity. Guoka displays the power of the dancer's bodily performance. Since it is the dancer who's the master of the performance, the dancer actually controls the music if they know the codes. The make drummer, who's the middle drummer, and Kian, if you click, I think the make will be named here. Yep, thank you. Um, the make drummer takes his cue from the dancer, following the dancer's movements with the drum sounds. Guoka demonstrates the importance of dialogue, exchange, reciprocal communication. The eye contact and back and forth between the dancer and the make drummer is essential. Today, there are Guoka festivals in the Caribbean and in France, and Guoka takes up a touristy popular square in the center of the capital of Guadeloupe, Pointe Pitre. So in my talk today, if we can go to the next slide, I will explore the work and pedagogy of Lena Blue, an innovative Guadalupean dance luminary who draws from this Guoka tradition to create innovative choreography and to train artists, students, and community members. She's the founder of the renowned Trilogie Lena Blue Dance Company, 
and she runs a dance training center that's considered by many to be the heart of Guadalupean culture. She's created a dance technique, the Tecnica, that's based in Guoca and taught in dance schools across the world alongside um, modern technique by Martha Graham and others. She has received prestigious international honors for her contributions, including the highest national order decoration in France, the Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur, the Knight of the Legion of Honor. Having trained herself in Guadeloupe's first Guoca school, the Académie du Ca, which is shown in the next slide, Lena Blue has found innovative, captive way, captivating ways of renewing Guoca's communal, communicative, and spiritual power for, through contemporary performance. For Lena Blue, Guoca is the key to unlocking identity and to entering into relation with another. So next slide, please, with her work, oh, sorry. Um, Lena Blue valorizes Caribbean-centered arts on the international stage. She says that she needed to create her Technica dance technique in order to make Guoca legible to the world. Through the Guoca inspired, though these Guoca inspired lessons come from Guadeloupe, they help us to understand, according to her, the Caribbean and also the world at large. And it's worth noting that in the context of Guadeloupe, the stakes involved in putting this plantation derived art form on the international stage are different than they would be in, for example, Haiti. As you know, Guadeloupe has been a French overseas department since 1946. In other words, this island is part of France and its citizens carry European Union passports. Well, dependency on France certainly causes many problems. It also provides opportunities to work the system. Lena Blue's company in Guadeloupe receives regular subsidies from the French government. Thus, Lena Blue's work to valorize Guoca should also be understood as a response to this cultural dependency on France, which is basically a twofold problem. One, the assumption that French culture is supreme, and two, the expectation of cultural assimilation that Guadeloupeans should become French. So if Lena Blue insists on the universalism of Guoca, which she does, and works to share her performance practices internationally, it's partly because in Guadeloupe, she must inevitably reckon with France. And um, in this international context, she finds other routes, for example, through Senegal, Venezuela, Mexico, the Dominican Republic, um, where you all are in Trinidad and Tobago or the US to name some of the places that her company has performed. Um, so um, next slide, please. I'm working to refine and expand on my theory of staging creolization through Lena Blue's work. So through this work that's dance, also um, with an emphasis on questions of creolizing history and, in, and the international component. So in my book, um, rather than a linguistic phenomenon, I locate creolization in performance. Um, I theorize it as a performance-based practice of reinventing meaning and resisting the status quo that corresponds with Caribbean syncretic performance practices. For me, creolization is not an identity, but an ongoing process. And it's not just a hybrid syncretic and intercultural aesthetic, but rather a dynamic process of creolization in motion informed by history and based in the African derived principle that performance is a space of creativity and transformation that connects past, present and future. So you'll see in the next slide, a group of pioneering women playwrights. Um, and it was based on their work that I developed this theory of staging creolization in my first book. Um, 
And by putting forth this theory, I established their centrality in the history of French Caribbean theatrical production. I explore how they, um, rather than affirming a static vision of creoleness, dramatize a dynamic process of creolization in motion by playing with ambiguity and contradiction and rearranging and remixing cultures, historical narratives, and epistemological systems. In the next slide, you'll see some of the some photos from the production histories of their plays and um, the ways that the plays were enacted internationally creolized once again the text through scenic and bodily representation, often in ways that surprised the playwright herself. So um, today I'm focusing in the next slide on this uh, a larger project about the relationship between history and Caribbean performance. Um, and the work on Lena Blue, along with another artist, Gilbert Lemore, um, was published in this book, Colonialism, Slavery and Performance. Um, this also grows out of a translation on the next slide that I've done with Andrew Daly of um, the play Histoire de Negre created under Edouard Glissant's direction at the Institute of Martinican Studies, the Institut Martinique d'Etudes. So um, how, on the next slide, how can we learn from Lena Blue's work to reactivate her enslaved ancestors' bodily subjectivities? Her art transmits embodied knowledge, that is knowledge found within the body, but that transmission occurs both bodily for people who are learning her techniques, as well as visually for those who go to her professional shows. In addition to viewing her art and participating in her workshops and rehearsals, to prepare to write this work, I also engage dialogically without her, with her about her work, either as an interpreter um, of public discussions um, or through informal um, discussions as well. So Lena Blue insists that anyone of any culture, race, or background has something to learn from her Guokai inspired performance practice. And she's invested in sharing her work internationally. As I mentioned, her technique, the technica, is now taught at several mainstream dance schools. And it's been performed, for example, by the Swiss Beja Ballet. Um, I argue that this focus on international collaboration and diffusion is not a betrayal of Guoka's authentic Caribbeanness, but rather a reinvention of its key quality, its performative syncretism. Some might view Lena Blue as westernizing the Caribbean in performance form of Guoka, but I see her as further creolizing Guoka in that she's making manifest the core transformative and regenerative power of African derived ritual, what the Yoruba call Ase. Creolizing Caribbean performance cultures allows Lena Blue to reactivate the history of Guoka in the present as opposed to performing a static vision of what Guoka once was. So let's look at her work in some more detail. If you could look at the next slide, please. Lena Blue's performance practice holds a life philosophy and identity and a mode for encountering others. All of these are encapsulated for her in the concept of big D, the Creole word for imbalance or instability. The Creole proverb, bigidi pas tombe, be off balance but do not fall, or perhaps totter but do not fail, and the movements, music, and experiences associated with bigidi help her to develop an understanding of the resilience of the Guadalupean people in the face of slavery, racism, economic exploitation, and natural disasters like hurricanes. 
As she explains in a TED talk, the experience of Big D, something she always had in her body, led her to a better understanding of Guadalupean modes of being. And then more generally, she extrapolates how a person can be in the world with others. Big D is about identity, resilience, and survival. Big D refers additionally to the movements found in the Lewa's dance, the signature rhythm of Goka, in which the dancer in permanent imbalance rapidly changes the point of support on his or her feet. Big D is also the code exchange between that Mackay drummer and the dancer, since the dancer pretends to fall in order to ask for the reprise, that is to ask for a new ka beat and thus begin a new set of motions. So in the next slide, I want to show you what biggity looks like. If the video works, you'll see Lena observing traditional guoka and then showing us how she made her technique from guoka. Hop, dance avec moi, Lena. Je serai technique. C'était ça mon obsession. Comment saisir une technique du corps à partir du Goka. Je voulais saisir la colonne vertébrale du Goka et inventer une technique corporelle qui part réellement de la codification naturelle du Goka. Écoute. Pourquoi cette rythme Pourquoi le tomb black L'entité K est tout. C'est vraiment un, un monde euh, immense. Apprivoise, temps et contre-temps. À la reprise So you see how she uses the full potential of her feet, um, dancing on toes, heels, the outside of the feet and the inside. The dancer is continually off balance, but never falls. And Lena Blue makes this embodied experience readable through her Technica manual, which we can see on the next slide. She codifies. Observe. Um, Je suis Bigidi. Toujours en déséquilibre. Must have started the video again, but if we could go to the next slide. Perfect, thank you. Um, so you see these different positions for the feet. Um, to experience Big D, Lena invites workshop participants to play with these different points of support on the foot and to change rapidly. In the next slide, I have an excerpt from a workshop that she ran at my university. And you can see um, how she's inviting the participants to play with this imbalance without falling. Yes. If you are here, stay, stay, and here, here, you, you, you must have the out of balance all the time, not a uh, table. In the next slide, you can see Lena's signature choreography, Finette sur mon bigadi et moi, which enacts her experience of discovering bigadi and her realization that her strength as a Caribbean woman comes, in fact, from her embrace of imbalance. And we don't have a video for this one, but on the next slide, we do. Um, it's a collaboration with documentary filmmaker Sylviane Dampierre. Through this collaboration, Lena Blue used her technica to perform an unknown historical experience through dance. Um, just to tell you a little bit about it before we watch, the film portrays Dampierre's return to Guadeloupe from France to rediscover her origins. To piece together her story, they draw from several sources, archival research, oral histories, and Lena Blue's dance. Dampierre discovers the name of a woman she believes to be her ancestor, labeled Jeannette, AKA the unknown. Lena Blue imagines and activates a bodily story of how Jeannette would have received her freedom papers from the white man who is previously her master. 
her dance shows the ambiguity of the line separating slavery from freedom. And by drawing from Guoka, performs Dampierre's ancestor Jeannette's bodily subjectivity, her experiences of oppression, resistance, and survival. So let's watch that. Okay, thank you. And to the next slide. Um, in a lecture last year, Lena Blue, actually a few years ago, Lena Blue explained how it was essential for her to make the technica and facilitate deeper understanding of Big D for two reasons. One, to document the dignity of the Caribbean people and the richness of their culture. And two, to understand what the little island of Guadalupe has to contribute to the rest of the world. She asked the American college students at the University of Georgia to promise her that the next time they felt unstable, they would not break down, give up and cry, but rather remember their experience with her of biggity. Key to Lena Blue's pedagogy is the idea that the technica, not only the technique, but also the ka identity and its experience of embodied resilience can be transferred to any dancer, any student, any workshop participant in any country created from the forced interculturalism of the plantation. Guoka is essentially a dialogue between that soloist Make drummer and the dancer who knows the codes. Lena foregrounds this understanding of Guoka as an encounter with another. By sharing her technica internationally, she renews that encounter and thus reactivates the characteristic syncretism and transformative quality of Guoka dance. She transmits embodied lessons in the Caribbean past of Big D for the sake of the future. And so in conclusion, I see Lena Blue's work reactivating Guoka, not as recovering or preserving a pure Caribbean culture, but rather reactivating this inheritance in the present, which serves two purposes. One, to remedy the mistake of dismissing Caribbean popular culture's complexity, richness, and value. That's the mistake of the colonial logic that endures. And two, to share Guoka's spirit, philosophy, and life lessons with the rest of the world. Lena talks, as I said, about coming from a small island, but believing that her island has something important to contribute to the world. Her contemporary performance practices can be understood as a reenactment of enslaved people's rituals, social gatherings, and strategies for psychic survival, first for the Caribbean and second for international artists and audiences. These embodied performances and experiences of Big D are among the precious lessons Guadalupe has to contribute to the world. By further creolizing Guoka, Lena Blue reactivates the resilience, communal regeneration, contradiction, sarcasm, sacred dialogue, improvisation, improvisation riffing, and the imbalance practiced by her ancestors. Thanks. That's my presentation. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, I want to move to Crystal Adonis and before the collision between the Europeans and the Africans and that whole crucible, uh, of course, in the beginning, they were the indigenous people um, who predate everyone in this discussion. And I wanna get um, the input now from Christo Donis to just to explicate on that. And, his experience and the experience of the indigenous people. So over to you, brother. Pambrika Sato Horukan, which is greetings. Are you hearing me? Yes, loud and clear. 
Uh, greetings and I also tell you good evening. Now, first I'm going to say something in Creole. Moka Santi Koyon Wagvet, Ayon Dance Pool. Do I have to translate? Or Travis will do that? Put you can this, Monsieur. Put you can this, So, um, now that you, I've you, got. Now that I've gotten his attention, <laughs> after listening to the these esteemed presenters, and um, I must say that when I f was first approached, um, I thought of Quayol as speaking Quayol, and I told um, Travis that. So um, I was a bit amazed. Anyhow. My name is Christo Adonis. It doesn't sound French there at all, or Creole. And um, I live in Arima. I grew up, I went to school. My first school was in Brasos Ecopare because in years gone by, estate owners would have a townhouse in Arima and have one in the country. But my first school was in Brasos Ecopare. And Creole, to me, when, when people ask me, um, how you speak well, that, um, it was like a pig in mud. Uh, I grew up speaking well, so it's not like I went somewhere to learn it. And not only that, in my household, I would speak well here to one aunt and have to speak Spanish to an uncle, uncle right there without, you know, getting confused and then what used to confuse me was trying to master the Queen's English. Because in school, we had to speak English. So you have to remember when you go to school not to say something in Creole or in Spanish because the teacher wouldn't be pleased. My, my collaboration with the Lloyd Best Institute and um, the Caribbean Yard Campus, and that where I, I do... I am one of the moderators with, with uh, or one of the mentors with herbal medicine and uh, because I think I'm jumping the gun, I didn't mention my indigenous, um, uh, my, my, I, I, I belong to the first peoples of Arima, what people call the Caribs and I am the PI in the community which is, people know as the shaman or medicine man. And so I, I do these courses because according to our um, spirituality, we believe whatever knowledge that we learn, we must pass it on. Because why do you use having knowledge if you don't pass it on? It is bad. It is not good. But what I want to tell people is that a lot of the herbal medicine that we know about in Trinidad is known by quail name. Even we, the indigenous people, use that, and the majority of indigenous people spoke well. So today what I want to do is have a little conversation with you all in Quayol, because um, I did not um, anticipate the, the Creole business and the Quayol. La moitié est un jeune homme, parce que moi vie actuellement. Mais aller en Guaba pour garder pour lui Et puis, moi je voulais boire check, qui boit glow. Moi je assise pas bon yon petit live here. Et puis moi je fais yon feuille, yon feuille banane. Et puis moi je fais yon petit pot et puis, et puis commencer à boire glow. Là, moi, tout la tête, mais moi, je vois un petit nom comme ça. Un nom qui est à pile, chivé, à tout coin. Et puis, il m'a demandé ça, je vais faire là, à Guaba. Moi, je suis venu chercher, 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 
Et puis, nous avons demandé à moi, vous connaissez qui vous avez dit? Je dis non. Il dit, eh bien, moi, c'est mettre pour avoir ça. Vous connaissez les gens qui aiment mon papa voir? Moi, c'est mettre ici. Et puis, moi, je regarde toutes ces bêtes-là. Les gens viennent ici pour tuer yo. Et puis, ils ont only damagé yo. C'est moi qui suis pour gérer yo. Et puis, ils ont on ou bien venir ici à quoi? Ou ni pour mener ou mener des pieds ou? Pour oui, des moins. Pour gérer ces bêtes ça. Moi, je me ça ou bien moi mener? Il dit moi. Ça zot ka f- servi. Ça zot kaib ka f- servi. Moi vle tabak. Ou tchenta ou ka vini esi. Ou ke mene tabak. And, and now. It's a story of taking a journey into the high woods. And encountering the caretaker of the forest. And he asked me what I was doing there. So I told him that I came to look for medicine to help out with folks. And he told me, well, if I want to return there, I must also bring medicine. And the medicine that I should bring is tobacco. Because that, to we in the in our community, it is one of the most important plants. Now to continue with my my life speaking Creole and being among Creole people, it is because of the composition of us in the indigenous community. We there are no pure blooded First Nation people anymore in Trinidad and Tobago I should say we are mixed with African we are mixed with Spanish or Latino as we say both both on my maternal and my paternal side a mixture of indigenous African well on my paternal side it is indigenous French African my mother Spanish indigenous and African so when people ask me I say I'm a Kalaloo and um, Kalaloo is a very nice dish here in Trinidad. I, I think you all might like it. But it's a mixture of different plants and herbs and so on. So we grew up knowing where the Creole was concerned. It's like when it had a week and the, the, the songs that they sang in the week and, and the dances they would have, which we call bongo and so on. You would hear people singing in Creole or what people say, Patwa. And also here in Trinidad, I, I think it was last year I was doing um, some work with um, Namdi Hodge and before that with Dr. Joan Ferreira. And um, right in the community, our community, um, we did something on medicine. And um, there are a lot of people, there were people from Matnik and Guadeloupe also and um, people thought that it's only people from Paramin in Trinidad that spoke Creole. And a lot of people still have that perception. A lot of people. And um, right here in Arima, Arima, which was the capital of Coco in ages gone by, that was the language of the people. Because the, the French planters were better managers, and I hope I don't... Um, offend any Spanish people because um, and I would like to offend them a bit too because of what they did to my ancestors they were poor managers of estates and so on the French were better managers better plantation managers and so on so the that influence so the, we had in Arima a lot the people in the encomiendas or the, the what some people tell me the other day the reservation that they had made for my ancestors the majority of indigenous people were speaking Creole they had Spanish name, they had, they had blood Spanish, but the language was Creole. 
the whole of Arima. And then you go to places like Blanchichelles and um, Mont Lacroix, Toko, Matlot, and those places, Paria Bay. Ta it have a place we still say and people pronounce it bad. I think they even spell it bad. They call Takarib when it's Tekaib, meaning Carib land. And all those people along the north and north and northeast coast were speaking Creole or Patois. But for whatever reason, everybody thought it was only Paramin in Trinidad that they spoke Creole. And um, so we had this when it we had these songs and um, dances when people died. Um, they were what they were called bongo thing, and they were all in Creole. They were all in Creole. It is now. I, I find it very strange that I hear a lot of people saying that I I am I belong to a family of eleven. My mother have because we are all alive and she's still alive too. Eleven children. She's 91 years and um, I am number six. I am right smack in the middle. So I give everybody trouble on both sides. Those before and those after. Now my elder brothers would understand a conversation in Creole, but they cannot speak it. And the younger ones, they, they don't even understand. And um, there's quite a, my brothers and a lot of people keep saying they didn't want us to learn it. They, they said it was big people language and they, and I never, I be, I'm being very honest with, with you guys, I have never experienced those type of thing from my parents, my uncles. No, nobody ever prevented me from learning. As a matter of fact, they encouraged me to learn it. I would speak Creole with my, my uncle here, go down the road by my godmother, who couldn't speak English at all and have to speak Spanish. So when I was about nine years old, I was... And it was never any problem. Now, the, the, the Spanish that we would say we were speaking in Trinidad is what people will call Espanol Cacao or Coco Spanish. Um, because I remember once I was singing a song. My song still plays on, on the radio and, and so on. And I was told that I wasn't grammatically correct. Um, and I had was to tell one of the persons that I had poetic license so that I just change a word because can you imagine Mighty Sparrow singing Gene and Dinah in proper English? Nobody would sit down and listen to him at all. So it is um, the song that I sing, and we can we can consider it a creolized version of Parang. It's a song that I call Don Alberto. So I'm asking the question, now in proper Spanish you will say, Adonde Don Alberto? But I abbreviated it for the music. So I say, Donde, Donde, Don Alberto, Don Alberto no aquí. Don Alberto en la montaña se va para medicina. So I'm telling a story of Don Alberto going for medicine, it is still there. But you know, um, it is said because for competition and what it wasn't grammatically correct and so on and so on and so on. But I find it sound very good anyhow and a lot of people love it. And um, and when we use the word creolize, we must realize that it have a lot of things that we will creolize. For example, we wouldn't go in the market and say we want a bottle of Anato or Bixa or Relenda. We will say we want a bottle of Uku or Ruku. It's a natto, but we would go and ask. So that if you go and ask somebody for a bottle of natto, they will be watching it as though you are alien or something like that. So um, there are quite a, a lot of words um, when you speak Creole that has indigenous words in it. And um, in, in, in even in... in um, you hear in Parang that is sung by local entities in Trinidad that it would have Creole in it. So I, my contribution tonight, my word to tell you and, and let you know about there are people who still in this country speak Creole other than Param, Paramin 
and then if you meet any people who are dealing who are in herbal medicine nine if i may say about 80 percent of the medicine they will be telling you they will be telling you in creole name and um so we speak creole every day every day in trinidad we use Quarrel name and we does and, and places and we doesn't even uh, realize that we are using those words. So that's a little bit for me. I I I will be I can be more vocal if if I were speaking about my indigenous culture, my indigenous practices, which I do on a daily basis, and. Um, my medicinal i but um as i said before wavet it it pa bon pou wavet to pou ale a zafe pool thanks so much man this thank you and i sure i just i sure brought me a little <laughs> you 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 not a nato <laughs> <laughs> okay on that note, Ivan, that's beautiful, man. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, I want us to turn it to Roald Gibbons, who will have the last word and words. And um, I don't know what to say. Language, language of the body, language of the tongue. Um, Roald, over to you, man. We'll be making some adjustments and stuff in the meantime. Um, what I'd like to, to, to address is what Emily said. She just said that there was, um, she was delinking it. I don't want to say delinking, that's a heavy word, but from the linguistic creole, to the performative creole, and I think from the language of tongue, lingua, and to the language of the body in space and time or through space and time. I thought about those two balances and the correlator potentially between the two of them, between Creole language, spoken language, and gesture, idiomatic gesture and movement, you know? Because I, in my own films, <clears throat> I have a thing called the dialect, which is what I would say is a visual correlative of the Creole dialect, you know? How does it manifest and how the, 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 the characters um, in the films would relate physically. Even when we looked at Travis at the beginning, you might notice that he's very, very um, expressive with his hands, right? He's, he's, he's in motion right through. So speaking quail and the physical movement of body, body that language of the, of the flesh. So um, Travis, anything uh, with, with Roy? Um. Yeah, um, I just messaged him. Um, um, I'm not sure. Um, I just messaged him. Yeah, he was he was on earlier. Um, okay. Yeah, so I'm not sure. Well, we in, yeah. we in these uncertain times with the internet and such. Yeah? But do you want to mm -hmm. kick it up? But uh, let's let's because it's kind of it's getting to the hour too. Eh? So you want to kick over to the Q and A? Um, yeah, right. That sounds good. Now. Yes. So let's invite people, you know, to folks come on board and, you know, any kind of questions or answers or statements you want to make would be great. You're always welcome. So don't rush, but come with it. Yes, sir. Yes. May I ask a question? Yeah, welcome. Yes, um, uh, listening to my Trinidadian friend there, uh, it's good to see Travis. Travis and, um, and I marked CXC together uh, in Barbados and so on. Um, <laughs> yeah, CXC English. Uh, but, um, Hi, Dion. What's up? <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, uh, the Creole being spoken by my Trinidadian friend, it, it doesn't sound like Spanish. I know a bit of Spanish, but um, 
is the Creole of St. Lucia, the French Creole and that Creole that was being spoken. Are there any similarities in, in, in what you said? Can I? Similarities um, between what, sorry? He wants to is know it, with, sorry, <laughs> go ahead, bro. Yeah, yeah the St. Lu, St. Lucian Patwa. And uh, what the Trinidadian, um, is, I don't know his name. That, that okay, was, well, <laughs> I understand your question. Um, well, the first time I visited Paramin, um, and I spoke with the elderly people there in Creole, it seemed more or less identical to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and people at Paramin. In fact, I felt I felt um, I was among my people, and and I developed a theory that I have to follow up and do some research. I felt that these these were solutions, you know, you know, <laughs> that these that they came because it was just so uh, immediately familiar the, the language, you know, uh, speaking with them. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. you see, remember that um, at the time of the cedula, and was it seventeen eighty three, when the Spanish. Um, uh, invited the, the French to come into Trinidad. Um, and that was a time when um, the French colonies, there were a lot of insurrections following the, the, the Haitian um, revolt, etc. Um, well, the revolt basically before the eventual revolution, but there were all these there were revolts happening in the French colonies at that time, soon after the French Revolution and so on. Um, you know, liberté, fraternité, égalité. Um, so, there was restlessness in the French colonies, including St. Lucia and all of the others. And so the planters grabbed the opportunity and they took their enslaved with them and they went to Trinidad. Now, mm. around that time, what was happening in St. Lucia as well was that um, the, what we call the Megmawon, that is the, the Maroons in the St. Lucian Mountains, um, were caught up between the French and the British um, um, wars, but, but they themselves, um, had had took over St. Lucia, that is the, the, the brigands, the like, oh, had taken over St. Lucia, and so the French planters, as well as the slaves, had run to Martinique. So, um, and St. Lucia and Martinique always had that kind of relation, because Martinique has been the port, even when the enslaved came, they were brought, they were brought first to Martinique, and then taken from Martinique, and, and brought to St. Lucia on the plantations. But the point I'm making is that, um, even those enslaved uh, Africans who came me to Trinidad by way of Martinique could have actually come from loads of them mm -hmm. from St. Lucia as well because they, because that was the kind of a relationship that was happening. Um, mm -hmm. When they run, they run to Martinique, then they were taken from Martinique and, and so on. So and Martinique and St. Lucia, because of the proximity, I mean, the canoes mm -hmm. take people back and forth every day. Um, are really, the Creole people are really one people. Of mm -hmm. So, so the so the language, the Creole language, you find the similarities between say Saint Lucia, Martinique, and what I observe from those in Paramin are very, very, very close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. did, yeah. Did that, that 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 um on a clear day in Martinique, you could see Saint Lucia, and a clear day in Saint Lucia, you could see Martinique. Um, I'm interested in that proximity you talk about. Trinidad, I'm looking at. Uh, proximity and only in terms of movement, migration, and a period and a movement is what you're speculating about. I just want to go a little further on in this question of transferability of Creole. Um, for instance, um, the film I did in Haiti, the 60% of the Haitian Creole probably is being picked up by someone, an audience in St. Lucia, or when I was in um, Burkina Faso, in, in Bagadougou and showing the film, um, they could understand some of the Asian Creole, a lot of it in fact, enough to, to follow because they have their own Creole, right? So Mauritius, I don't know about Mauritius and these places, but I, as in my ignorance, I too would like to know from a linguist and so on, how much um, how people, people can understand back and forth, you know, within the language, you know, Me these languages. May I, may I say something? Yeah, man. Um, to me, I understood the gentleman was saying 
that when I was speaking, it does not sound like like that quail has any Spanish. What what I said when I was what when I was young in Brazos Seco Paria, both sides of my family they spoke quail and they spoke Spanish. I'm not saying that the quail the words are entwined with the Spanish. I was saying I was saying that I spoke separately but at growing up in, in one area. And that you will find from time to time someone speaking Spanish will be talking about, about a plant but will be using a quail name. If it make if it clarify anything. Yeah, that's clear. The Patois Chronicles. Very important. I'm I see Caribbean Yard Campus um yeah. Yeah man. Bro? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, man. All right, better. Better. I have this this allergy. Oh no. Yeah, I have an allergy to, to academia. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh Lordy. Yeah. Well, what I'm about a little walk on the you want to walk a, a little walk on the intellectual side or the spirit side or whatever takes your your, your blood, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm glad to see Ken Crosby. I just want to say that. Yeah, I saw his name there. Yes, yeah. Ken, holy fort, man. So, Roll, anything we want to add in terms of performance and performance now, performance future. I would like to ask you about performance future, you know, what do you see? You have, you are this reservoir of, 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 of all of this, this. Well, you asked a question before about, um, about Creole forms in relation to what's happening now with COVID and so on. And, um, you know, my take on that is that we've always been, the whole idea of, of, of of, of, of uh, creolity, realization, or however you want to term it, is about adaptation. Yeah. I mean, we <clears throat> realize because we, we endure the greatest trauma as a population mm -hmm. that the world ever faced. So in the light of that, this is really, this is minor. I mean, it's finite in this for some people. People lose their lives and so on. There's that. But in terms of continuity, you know, I have no doubt that we will, we will find ways, and particularly, in particular, in the Caribbean, given our particular history, if we dig back into it, if we go back into our own resources, which is the thesis of Caribbean Yard Campus, right? that we have our resources within ourselves as a community, as a collective community, to deal with whatever faces us. So the yeah. idea of whether carnival will happen or not, I mean, carnival may not happen in the way that we expect it to. Mm. That this has forced us into a kind of reflection about the value, not necessarily the form, but the value of what carnival mm. is to us. And the form will emerge. Carnival is not, doesn't, it's not fixed, you know. Yeah. It's been adapted and, and the, the form will emerge, you know. We will absorb that and, and, and move on. Yeah. So, so this is what, this is what I, 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 I feel about in terms of your, your last, your, the question that you started with. Um, my apologies um, for participating in the rest you, of the discussion. You know, man. Everything is time, man. But this, they, 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 this might sound cute, but the irony of this masking, you no know, more people are masked than ever now. Exactly. <laughs> and, um, instead of <laughs> instead of prohibiting it, it's it's now uh -huh. um, it's now required. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah. And there's no there's some connection to me in the whole act, idea of masks because I mean take it away from I mean carnival. Yeah, it's part of that is like the what is behind because a lot is hidden now. 
You know, all you get is the eyes, and maybe we need to look to that because that 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 thing shines very brightly when you when you only focus on that. <laughs> yeah, 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 and we've already started to explore that. Yeah, you know, all kinds of things with mass. Yeah, you know, so there's no doubt that we approach it in a very creative, in a very creative way. I wouldn't mind organically if the audience comes in. But I want to ask one thing, maybe to kick off another another mode is. Um, in terms of the language, you know, you talk, you, you write dialogue and for theater, I too, so on, and Travis and so everybody. And the generations that come, I'm not saying this in, in, in a judgmental way, I'm just saying there is a recession, I believe, of the language. You know, some of the extremes are on TV with the people who read the news or what the news readers who have this, in the, I don't know what, some sort of uh, construction. Um, you know, and there's the, uh, the American. Um, idioms and stuff have sort of seeped in, to say the least. How do you see that influencing our literal speech and um, expression? You know, the language itself it coming out of that. Is there a way of, is there, is that, because that itself is, um, I mean, we talked about process, but, and, and change and all of that. Part of the continuum, creolization, are we talking now, are we also talking of American neo-colonialism, at least in a particular epoch, which may be passing, but that has influenced us too. I mean, we know in Carnival and Midnight Robber and so, and American Sailor and blah, 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 has been there as well. So yeah, the, difference between, the difference between um, what happens on the street, let us put it that way, or the way we mm -hmm. know contemporary terms, and what you put on stage mm. is, is, the, is, the, is the, the critical view. The fact that you select what it is you yes. do, how people speak, what the characters say, and so on. How they say what they say, the language that you, that, that you choose. So that it's, 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 it's all up to the, it's all up to, the, to, to how the artist, how the playwright would view, views mm -hmm. land, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's perfectly, Possible. I mean, you can you, you use. I, I I've been looking at some of the contemporary work, young playwrights who are doing work for the playwrights workshop and so on. One in particular, and the language is very contemporary, uh, and that's 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 okay. <laughs> your, your audience is not an audience in the nineteen sixties. Yeah, you know, you're writing for an audience now, and you've got to find ways to reach that audience. I can't handle that. I, I can't deal with that language. I don't, I can't write in that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I am recalling the past. I'm recalling what I know, what I hear. Yeah. Right in my memory. Um, but I would wonder if, um, I don't see any reason why, I'm, I'm not saying it has to be done, but I don't see why um, there cannot be a regeneration as well, you know? Because if it can change in the neo-colonial context, the neo-colonial context can also be altered as well. In other words, um, not just in, um, <clears throat> in performance or on film or whatever, um, or in a recording or something, but in everyday life to reintroduce, right? Rediscovery then um, is possible. For, for psychic survival, maybe it could happen. I don't see why not. not um, there's adaptation too, because I would say, like my Jamaican former brother-in-law, when we were in the States, I remember we'd go into a drive, was drive through and he's, he's speaking an American to the drive through and he's asking us in the car in Jamaican, Patwa, what we want. <laughs> so that's that schizophrenic adapted, adapting of individual, you know? So I don't well, know. It might, yeah, it might be schizophrenic. I mean, I think, I think we have the capacity to use our languages, you know. Yeah, don't so, mean to again in, 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 yeah, in the in yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, clinical yeah. sense. Yeah, but yeah. Just, the term, the yeah. term suggests that. The term suggests that. No, no, it's actually a good yeah. thing because I believe yeah. the bilingualism, like what you get in Saint Lucia, um, which when you're bilingual, you don't notice, you don't really speak one, two languages. You grow up speaking a continuum mm -hmm. of one language, mm -hmm. and that may be people who might say that give rise. You have your Walcotts and your 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 you have two Nobel Prize you know, and kind of things happen. And even watching a young sprinter from Saint Lucia coming up. And um, there's some theories that that, that that actual strengthens it because it expands your capacity, you know, from youth, from birth, you know. So all of the above. Any, but I think we, you want, you have an issue we take. Um, we could speak and um, bring in questions and stuff to the panel. Anybody wants to address any particular panelist or has something on their mind that somebody can 
could respond to. Um, I think you could come in now. Okay. You know. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was. I wanted. Um, I was interested in. Um, well, I am interested in Rolls Ailawa, mm -hmm. and because mm -hmm. I mean, when I first read the plea, what immediately struck me was, um, I mean, I Lawa Lawa actually means in Creole, in French Creole, like the king. Um, I'm not sure that's what role intended, but that's what it means. And I realized too that there were um, many crews in what you call patwa in, in the play. So I was really interested in, in how it came to the use of the of the crew in Ailawa. Well, yeah, can I answer that? Yeah. yeah so it's, it's set in Ailawa is is set in the, it's about the Kibule moment. Mm -hmm. And it was a, it, it's set in that time. And that was a time when, of course, um, the lingua franca of Trinidad was Creole. So, so you know, you use the Creole as you could. And I came upon it, I was not, I, I'm not a Creole speaker. Right? I grew up in a place called Belmont, right? which is in Port of Spain. And um, we didn't have, well, I didn't have access to the language that way. So, but when I was doing work, my graduate research, I found out that in order to, to penetrate anything in terms of culture in Trinidad, you had to have a grasp of the language because, I mean, the, 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 um, the songs, you, the calypsos, the, uh, the, the work songs, the calendar, the so on, all in Creole. So I had to find a way to, to deal with that, you know? Um, so dealing with this particular play, that's, that, that, that's, that, that, that's where that started. But of course, it's not only a question of the language in Ailawa, it's also the, the, the calendar form, you know? And, um, you know, using the, using the energy of the form rather than simply the form of the form. You know? so, so that's what goes there. That's what happens there. Anybody and yes, have it's, a it's Ila Wise King, mm -hmm. clearly. Anybody from, who has a question? Yes, uh, me again. Um, I find uh, uh, it a bit instructive that Travis was saying that when he went from St. Lucia <coughs> to Martinique and so on, and even Trinidad, that he felt as though he was in St. Lucia. Mm. Uh, but uh, as a speaker of English Creole, uh, we mm. find variations across Diana, Trinidad, Barbados, Jamaica, and so on. And there are distinct differences, some of the language we don't understand. Uh, so I don't know. Um, you mentioned some transition from St. Lucia to Martinique and so on. But how did Trinidad come into that being? Mm -hmm. yeah, what I said to you was when I went to Aramine and I started speaking with the, the elderly right. people there, I actually attended a, a, a Creole mass. It was, one, um, it was around, around towards the end of October. So in the Catholic Church, they held a Creole mass. It was actually conducted by a Dominican priest, whose name I forgot at the time. And the songs were sung in Creole. Um, and then so afterwards there was a fair and I spoke with the elders there in Creole. And so what I'm saying to you, and, and later on I moved around the community and, and sat at one or two of the bars and spoke with some of the elder guys as well. And so what, what I felt was like I was speaking to my own people. Mm. Yeah? That's what I felt. I was speaking like I'd be in any community in St. Lucia speaking Creole to the guys around. And 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 I mean, it's not, it wasn't just the, the language, you know, um, it just felt, you know, it just, just felt like, you know, you know, being with, 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 with their, being there with them and talking. Perhaps it has something to do with the, you see, I mean, if you look at Paramin, the, the, the landscape, yeah, I mean, St. Lucia is a small mountainous island and, and Paramin mm -hmm. has that feel as well, huh? small and, and mountainous. So there was also that, but also just the, 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 the the body language and the demeanor of, of, of the people, they just felt like, it's, I mean, it's certainly a different type of personality than 
you know, then was you to run into uh, in, in, um, in, in 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 other parts of more developed parts of Port of Spain. It's a different different feel, yeah. Um, because I mean, the people that traditionally are farmers and um, etc. So um, yeah, so that's what I was saying. That's what I was saying. I mean, it, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, that's it. That's it. Really. Yeah. It just it just felt like one of my own people. I just wanted to, to just to make a note that I noticed the use of the word uh, words English Creole in terms of the Anglophone Caribbean, because a lot of times people um, see, see um, the language of, you know, of Creole as uh, Creole as um, Francophone Caribbean phenomena, you know, and that's very interesting to me. The other thing is. Um, when we talk about the dichotomy of, of standard English and, for instance, and we used to call dialect, um, at one time the Brazilian writers like Naipaul and them used to be, we talk about 50s going to the 60s, would be separating the descriptive from the dialogue as a standard English descriptive dialogue in um, what we call dialect until you would have people like Loveless just muddying the whole thing. The whole thing is in um, written in, um, in in your language, in your in our language, so to speak. So all of these kinds of um, ch uh, changes and and, and and the fashioning of uh, uh, shaping of this going forward, you know, through 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 um, present and the future is very important. So, I'm, but I'm very intrigued about that. Uh, this recurring um, comparison. Um, weighing of the two, you know? Because I speak, I mean, I can speak Bajan, Jamaican, you know? You know, I, I know of like Red Stripe. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm joking. I'm half Jamaican. But this language, we have to look at that and I think this is fascinating. The other thing, when if you go back to Emily, I also would be interested to see performatively in the dance, because I'm watching her, her clips of her dance and I'm saying, wow, I know that. You know what I'm saying? It's very similar. There's um, there's there's, there's a so I'd like to see the the language of the body and the language of the tongue, and both of those languages how uh, familiar are they in various um, Caribbean territories. Anybody else wants to weigh in? Uh, on that, on, on the note about the um, about the Creole in Trinidad, just to note that it's not only Paramina. Um, yeah. they're Creole speakers <laughs> in several places, in Blanchichez, um, Christo himself is from Paria, he's not from Paramin, um, Manzanilla and so on, all over, right? Not in the urban places, but you know, there are several places where there are, are still Creole speakers. Mm. Um, and, and I think also what, what Travis probably recognized is, is, is the retention even within the, the, the English speakers. I mean, Trinidadians sound like Grenadians to some extent, mm -hmm. and who are also Creole speakers, like St. Lucians, who are also Creole speakers, there's a similarity, mm -hmm. right? In the same way that there's a similarity between the way in which Tobagonian Tob speak, Tobago speech, and Jamaican speech, and Antiguan speech, right? And St. Kitts, right? And that's, that has to do, of course, with the, the influences. The, the structure is the same. The old Creole structures are the same, whether it's English or is, is, is French Creole or whatever. It's all the same African structure. Syntax, like that. And the, and the of course, the lexical aspects of it, um, you know, from wherever, from England or, you know, English or Spanish or, or or French or whatever, but um, the structures are the same with all the Creoles, you know. And maybe maybe you should you should also have a um, a Creole scholar in this discussion, you know, to tell yeah. us a bit more about that. But that 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 would perhaps um, explain some of the similarities that the question the the the, 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 the questioner was was inquiring about. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah let me. I, I wanted to sort of jump in there. Think wants to weigh in there some of what we're saying, which is interesting. Um, because, um, we, we came into, into um, 
Creole, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm saying in terms of say research in academia, uh, through, the lingu- through the linguist who were first examining the Creole languages, and, and as Rob was saying, and recognized the similarities in, in structures. So, for example, um, Jam- Jamaican Creole, what, Jamaican, what they speak, and and, and the French Creole, um, and people like um, certainly like Devonish and Carrington, Hazel Smoons, McDonald. Uh, would have done a lot of research in the area, I mean, Caribbean linguists, and, um, and looking at similarities in structures and so on. And then, um, then of course, found a deeper interest in, in Creole um, by way of cultural studies, etc. But certainly some people, is the, the linguists helped bridge the gap. You think of moving Aline, for example, uh, who was doing a lot of research as a linguist in, in, in the Creole languages. And then that led him looking deeper into the historical roots, um, and, and and you know, and then he eventually was able to say uh, how important um, Africa was to the construction of Caribbean identity. But the whole relation there uh, of, of structures also helps us see the connection because. In, in places where the, the Creole languages are spoken, these are also places where um, uh, the, the people have been able to create and uh, to sustain some really integral and dynamic um, cultural forms. So if you think of Palmy and the Blue, Blue Devils and, and the solution I mentioned, you know, etc. Um, but so structures, and if you think of what what um what Nettleford has said about the um the the, the importance of, of dance and ritual uh, etc. Structures are steps, you know, they 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 are steps. It's, it's movement. It's 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 grounding, and so it's no accident that 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 um where the Creole languages have developed and are maintained um, are also places where the, the Creole have been able were, 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 were sustained and developed because you know syntax step rhythm yeah movement you know it's, so, it's, so, so the connection is there um, really between the, the Creole languages the rituals the, and the forms and the, the, the identity. Anybody has any questions? They want to, to As well. weigh in. Um, I'm hearing a voice. You know, so the whole, so it's, it's, it's really amazing that... that uh, was yeah. Emily? Was that you, Emily? Yeah, I wanted to respond to Yao's comment as well, but then I, I noticed you were continuing <clears throat> to speak, Travis. I think my screen froze for a minute. So, um, but I, if I could just say quickly, um, also in response to Yao's comment, I think that it's the colonial organization um, that really makes us say, this is the Francophone, this is the Anglophone, this is the Hispanophone Caribbean. Um, and if we refuse the colonial languages as organizing principles, absolutely, we see those similarities. And when we look at performance, it's so clear, you know, even in Brazil, in the Bahian region of Brazil, it's the Caribbean. Um, and we see these same sort of um, African derived performances um, syncretized with other European dances and European forms. And we really see the agency of the performer, the performer's bodily agency in reinventing culture and reinventing meaning and um, being in contact with the ancestors and all of these different forms of agency. And because I'm so interested in the performer's bodily agency, I, I'm interested in creolization and performance, but um, I agree that you know the linguistic part is so important. And I'm really intrigued by what you say about the visual creolization. 
as well. Yeah. Anybody? That's Hans, Emily. Um, anybody want to weigh in? I, um, any questions? Anybody wants to say any, add anything to the part? Yes, I'd like to throw out a question, please. Sure. Welcome. Yeah, so um, my, I'm Jeanette from Jamaica. Hi, Travis. Hi, Rod. Hi, Jeanette. <laughs> It's a long time. Long time. But you know, we, we see each other on Facebook, so the technology connects us. Yes. Uh, my, my, my thinking question, comment, it's about language, you know, just moving on from the observations that these Creole languages seem to have these similarities in their structure. You know, I think it's that um, um, lady who wrote this book, uh, Miss Adams, who noted that the Haitian Creole and the Jamaican language have, are, are so much more similar in their structures mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. say Jamaican and English, uh, or, or say, you know, um, mm -hmm. the, the Haitian um, Creole to the French. So that, that kind of observation, mm -hmm. and I, I, you know, and you mentioned um, Professor Alain, and I'm thinking about the patterns of thought, the, the philosophies that, that lie behind these language similarities and, and whether, you know, I don't know if anybody has done any research. So I, to give a little example, in Jamaica, I might easily say quite often, you know, my spirit don't take you, my spirit don't take that mm -hmm. one. <laughs> I, I don't think there is anything to compare in, say, English. You know, when, when I say, my spirit take or my spirit don't take, you know, that's a, a kind of philosophical position, I think, which I, I was wondering if, mm -hmm. if, if, if Travis or, you know, anybody from Trinidad could say, do, would you have a similar phrase? My blood, don't take, my blood don't my blood don't take you my blood don't take my blood, you. your blood yeah okay but right. and, and maybe in a french creole too you you yeah. might there might be similar phrases you know yeah. it, it because because you see as professor Alain probably is the one i probably have noticed talking about how the language revealed to him um the philosophies and the perspectives you know and and he started you know hunting that down in 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 the africans and and so there will probably be, be these similarities across the caribbean where where whether you know and i'm sure you're going to find it in the indigenous people because of the importance and the sort of the, the, the foregrounding of the spiritual position. When you say, you know, your, 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 blood, your blood take or your spirit, that, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a philosophic, that's a clear philosophical position. You know, yeah. I, I don't know how I would even say it in English. It, it, as far as I think in sitting here thinking, no, there is no parallel in, in, in English culture for, for that kind of expression. No, that's what's good what is that you're doing? doing? Go ahead. Imagine, sorry, imagine the difference between I like you or my blood take you here. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah. one is obviously much more emphatic, I think. So the other one yeah. sounds like a robot. You know? It, it, so. it's, it's, it's worlds apart and, and I and the blood that is is encompassing the, the it's recognizing the spirit. Of course. It's recognizing the spirit in, in in the way that I like you does not. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, blood might be independent too, like as independent of a reason. So you yeah, can't help it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so that's just my two cents. Thank you. Yeah. The, the, uh, the blood take you is an interesting statement because um, it's it's quite it's quite in some ways quite specific, you know. In the in in the Yoruba tradition, the blood. The, the, the waters, the interior and external waters. Uh, it, uh, uh, Oshun, and Oshun is the principle of attraction. Okay. So in a way, 
the, 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 the spirit that you're talking about is, an, is a, the as, that aspect of spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oshun, Oshun is what brings people together, draws them together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when we say a blood don't take, in a way, it, it's, a, it's a recognition of that principle. In some yeah. ways, yes, it's, it's, it's very, um, it, is, it refers to an African worldview, way of seeing things, and, um, and talking about it too. And of course, the larger, it belongs to a larger corpus of, in the oral tradition of, of, of proverbs and so on that are a, a, a resource for philosophy and traditional wisdom. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what we've got. And it's what, when, 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 um, when Yao was talking earlier about regeneration of language and so on, um, that's one of the roots. I mean, the business of, 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 of verbs and traditional wisdom that's caught in the language. That is a very specific kind of area that has got to be, that we can pass on, that we can explore further. Yeah. But there, there are some things that you have no control over. Language will yeah. change in any case. You know, consequences will come and so on. But there are certain things that you can, if you treasure them, you, you can find ways, like as in all cultures, I mean, yeah. cult always a question of what people choose to pass on. I mean, that could define it in its way. It's important to survive survivor. And um, this is one of the areas, you know, that we can explore and develop. I'm thinking, um, you see, the changes might not necessarily be good either with, with the, the like a neo-colonial collision now. Um, look at pretty mass versus traditional mass. Right, the pairing down to just some very elemental stuff that's pretty much uh, flown in from somewhere um, versus the mythology and the whole the character, the tra traditional mass character, all the, the constellation of narrative and gesture and all of that has been pared down to something barely, that, that it's not even, it's not even, um, it's gonna really, um, it's generic, you know, it's generic. Yeah, but we have to be careful. <laughs> We have, we have to be careful about that kind of purism, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got to be very careful about that. Okay, but about, when I'm, what I'm trying to get at maybe is you're seeing a, you could see it's a change in the language, the body language and all the dance and all stripped down to some very basic movement and um, the, the much more overarching performance has been paired down maybe for commerce too, to get things moving faster, you know? So, okay. yeah, but yeah, you see, it's, it's no accident that um, if you think of the part of Spain, a lot of the people who, who, who held the, 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 the cultural forms uh, were, were, were from the nearby hills, uh, uh, yeah. Lavantil, Paramin, Upper Maraval area, Cascade, these, these, these areas, right? Yeah. Um, in, in Jamaica, the, the maroons in the mountains and in the Windward yeah. Islands like St. Lucia, the hills, because uh, because we were able to they were able to go and practice the, the, the forms, the rituals, and keep their steps and the structures intact, yeah. right? Um, yeah. so, but, what, but what you had conversely, because don't forget too that uh, the whole relation between language, colonization, the body, um, the, all, all these all these are connected because. Um, when, when the colonizers taught us to speak, you know, we had to be a certain way, our body, our face. When, when I, I um, do work with, with actors and try to get them to speak in Creole, I often have to tell them, you know, which when you speak in Creole, it's not like English, you've got to open your mouth, you've got to use your face, you've got to, you know? Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. you have to, whereas in English, where are you going? You tell, you know, so, um, yeah. right, I'm exaggerating a little, I know, but you get the point. So it is the same thing when, whenever, whenever, and, 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 and so in, in the early days when the Creole forms were developed and established is because the people were able to get away and practice um, yeah. the forms and keep, keep their keep the, the, the body language because in, yeah. Because it was in the interest and part of the strategy of the colonizer to to create a docile body, what 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 Foucault calls a docile body, yeah. So so that 
to look at it and keep your head at it and be able to, to escape this. <laughs> These are where the Creole languages and the Creole forms as well yeah. uh, were able to, to, to hold. Well, I, yeah, well, I, I was also looking at recession of language, including um, body language and um, many uh, 1970s in, in the Caribbean wore more bright colors, you know. We became, became more sophisticated or the market changed or whatever now that they were much more muted colors one um, generally. So if you went to a cricket in the in, in the Oval or wherever, it was a sea of all kind of bright colored clothes or people walked around, painted houses and so on. So we kind of got a little bit more, you know, we backed off that and went monotones. But what I would like to, to reflect on is what I too had, had, was talking about uh, with, the, with the retro colorism and, you know, the, the, the light-skinned women behind the ropes, you know, guarded by black men, like, you know, old times, like the, the trucks in the old days, you know, and that resurgence. And then, and of course, the, um, what has happened with class and a, 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 a re-emergence of, oh no, oh no, it never went away, but a, re, uh, a retro, almost such a retro move back to this privatization of mass and of, they dropped off from the, the masses. And how that is also, I would say, the inclination or the aspiration to a new language, that weird thing that's now coming up, which seems to be a bit thrown Miami and London, wherever, you know, blender, you know? So, and, and that, and that neo-colonial um, arc is now, um, I'm looking at the recession of the language itself and including the body language just as you spoke to all the actors acting in Creole, right? But we are less expressive with the hands and we've been watching you with your hands too. <laughs> but I noticed we are much less, if you want to see people express themselves with their hands, it's man, old guys in the rum shop and so on. Eh? We become much more conservative in our movement. That's why I say, and it's a narrowing down. It's not an expansion. And my question was, is that a good, a, is that a good progression? Right? It's actually recession of something that had been created. I'm not saying it didn't have to keep changing. It should keep always progressing as changing. As Emily said, it's an, a, a progression. However, I'm wondering if that there's a particular mix now that just doesn't resonate with the, with the flesh or the tongue or anything. And it's actually affecting our ability to manifest, you know, in any way, in, in, in words, and in, in, in movement, and day to day, you know, I'm thinking about it. Anybody wants to to, to weigh in on, on things? Yes, um, just Anybody? wondering. Yeah. yeah, just um, what came to me? Could the the violence? Uh, at least I'm thinking about Jamaica, the, the violence or the kind of potential for violence that I think people might be fearing when they walk on the street, um, go to school, go to wherever. Could, could that be something that is contributing to that restriction of, of the, the body or the voice? I don't know, that's what occurred. <laughs> The, the particular nature of violence now nowadays. <laughs> yeah. You know, violence is it's, it's not it's, it's it's no is longer. It wanna, wanna, sorry, Sean, does this Sean has been waiting you know, and um you wanna weigh in? Shonda? Yes, good evening. Welcome, man. Shonda Phillips here from the best country in the Caribbean, Sorrel. Hi, <laughs> Shonda. Hi, Travis. I was just Hi. reflecting on the statement made by my Jamaican friend when she said, my spirit in tech here, and I was wondering if she was in Guyana, because that's mm -hmm. a phrase we use very, very regularly, and persons understand that if you say your spirit in tech, then is that okay? Keep off. Okay, well, okay. We can talk, but um, a spirit in tech, it means we cannot connect on a level that there is a great deal of mistrust here, and it's something that we use. So I was pretty surprised to know that it's using the same vein in Jamaica. Yes, yes. 
Yes. Also, mm -hmm. as the discussion was going on, I was wondering at the back of my little mind whether at some point it's possible that uh, these different yeah. types of Creole and the different territories, if there is some way that other persons who are interested can learn, if like some conversational courses can be devised, mm -hmm. even if it's for mm -hmm. tourist purposes. Let's say mm -hmm. I want to visit St. Lucia. And I'd like to understand what's happening. And generally, when the St. Lucians start talking, I figure as if I'm from Mars. And when we speak Creole in Guyana, I remember at CXC, some of the markers used to want to know what I'm talking about. And for me, it's plain and simple. But listening to the wealth that we have in the Caribbean, just from this discussion, I'm wondering if there's some way we can better utilize it, better make use of it, seeing that it's Zoom and most persons are home and those kinds of things, how we can capitalize on that opportunity. Those are my few cents. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's, okay. there are some efforts, there are publications coming out from St. Lucia um, in, you know, to teach people Creole. And there are, um, I mean, Martinique and Guadeloupe has a lot of literature on that as well. Um, so yeah, so there is stuff in terms yeah. of online instruction. I don't know what's happening now, but that's certainly something that, that needs to be done, definitely. And there's, there's um, Carmelita waiting, ready? Carmelita? Good yeah. evening. Hi, good Hi. evening. I just, I just wanted to, it's more of a thank you to guys like Travis and all the panelists who are here. I wanted to say that as a, as a mom, my son only turned 25 last week. And I know that Creole, I didn't raise him on the Creole. I didn't speak Creole at home, but there has been a shift, at least in St. Lucia, Although my son currently resides in Houston, I came to see him and I could hear him speak Creole and use the language, the, the vocabulary of my great grandmother that I know. I honestly could put my hand up and know that I didn't teach him. So I just wanted to say that the work that all of you are doing here, it is bearing fruit because you have a 25 year old boy who speaks to his 23, 22 year old friends. And the way that he speaks the Creole, is not a, a version of the Creole, he's using it as if he was born in it. And it's just a testimony of everything that people, at least in the St. Lucian context, Dimple Louise, Travis Wicks, Folk Research Center, uh, Monsignor, Patrick Anthony, they've done to make sure that the language itself is a language that people really aspire to speak as opposed to something that is for the uneducated. And I really just wanted to just add here and say, well done to everybody in this forum and not in this forum who has made it their business to ensure that something that is so culturally ours is, yeah. is, is, is being passed on. I wanted to share a personal experience. I was on the, I was in Doha. I was at Doha airport on the 13th on my way to see my son. And there was a group of women and they were speaking and there was something about their gestures. There was just something that just resonated with me. And I'm like, I don't know. My eyes kept on going towards this group, the group of women. And then I had, I needed to go to the bathroom. And as I was walking to the bathroom, I heard, I heard it. I heard the Creole, the born of St. Lucia. And I'm like, ah, ah, that was it. It wasn't even that I had heard the language. It was something about their mannerisms that told me innately that these people are my people. I have to say there was a connection. And that is what Creole means for a lot of us, that connection. Even if we were not born in the same region or in the same island, the same country. The Creole connects us not just yeah. in the vocabulary, but in its in its in its in its in the way that we in the way that we present when we use it. And I just wanted to add this piece and say thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot for that. Um, we kind of slip um, towards the end yeah. over the finish line. But um, anybody yeah. wants to add anything? Yeah, I yeah. Yes, Andrew. And you, I, 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm hearing you. Okay, I, yeah. I just want to make two brief points. Sure. One, um, <laughs> Santa Cruz, where I come from, is a place where Creole was heavily spoken. But unlike PI's experience in Santa Cruz, um, coming out of Santa Cruz, as, as Roy said, um, Patwa was the lingua franca that everybody spoke, but it was deliberately discouraged. In fact, it was, it was called language kosher, hub mm -hmm. language. Yeah, it is yeah, a language yeah. that you must not speak if you have to develop if you have to learn English and go on in life. So it was language kosher, hog language, completely discouraged. And I think that has led to the fact that so much of it was lost, it was deliberate. And, uh, and of course, you could not speak it in, in school. And it became a kind of private language for the adults, for adult things to talk about. So I think in the, in the urban areas like Levantil and all over and areas like mine, Santa Cruz, yeah. it was deliberately discouraged. Yes. Yeah. Like, I, um, Teresa Marilla Montano was, uh, um, I did a documentary yes. on her called Minstrel Lady. In that documentary, she says that the older people didn't want the young people to speak Patois. And um, she said the same hog like how they say they consider it a hog language. She also said that they didn't want the young people to know what they were saying if they were talking people bad and so on. But it became a secret language of people of an older generation. And that is where we had a recession of it, you know? So as, as well as, you know, a lot of the way people don't want us to speak, um, when you see advertising in Trinidad, for instance, it's, you know, if you're using um, our language, indigenous language, they make it into a comedy all the time. It's just fun, you know? It's never, then you read the news in a serious tone and some kind of blend, you know? So that point, is, you had another point you wanted to make? Yeah. Um, no, well, I think that it is time for me to leave you all. And I just wanted to say thanks and to say that I have to leave at this point. I didn't expect us to go on quite this long, so. Thanks so much for, for being part of this and honoring us with your contribution. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just a plug, I'd just like to throw in a plug there, please. Um, that on the 31st of, of this month, the last Sunday of this month at six o'clock, um, DCFA will be premiering um, the film adaptation of The Fight for Bellevue. So at six mm -hmm. o'clock uh, on the 31st, there's the last Sunday of this month, that we'll be premiering mm -hmm. The Fight for Bellevue, the film adaptation, where we use Creole. So please um, look out for that. Uh, a poster will be going on. Travis, just let me say in response, um, some people have asked about books um, in Quail, I just wanted to mention that um, my collection of plays, um, Survivor, is mm -hmm. available um, with a lot of plays for young people and, um, and children, and it's available from Blue Edition in Tunapuna. I got my copy from Blue Edition yeah, uh, yesterday, I believe. Yes. yes. Nice. It's called Survivor, and there are about plenty, 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 plenty plays in it. And it's come, it comes from a poem that's very interesting. It, the poem says, You know me, I name Survivor. I survived through the strength of my culture. You know, so it, it, it links. And it has plenty language kosher in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's an excellent collection for children, excellent collection for students. There are plenty of yeah. but not plenty copies of it. So, you know, people should check. Blue edition. Yeah, I was just saying that it's available at Blue, yeah, Blue Edition. Yeah, yes, of course, of course. Have a good night. Yeah, have a good so night. on that note, I think, night, night. 
On that Bless note, you man, and folks, thank you. folks um, thanks for joining us, man. And um, I think Merci, feel... very gratifying. And I want to turn it over to Travis to just say, uh, with the denouement. Right? <laughs> All right. Merci, 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 un peu tout le monde. Merci, merci. Um, moi, bien apprécié tout le monde qui participait, qui venait, qui parlait, vous savez, avec nous, pour dire nous uh, toute l'histoire sur Creole, expérience. I really, really appreciate sharing your, you sharing your experiences and being with us and sharing with us about your, your perspectives and your experiences with Creole and those who ask questions. Um, Chebe Red, Chebe Red, hold tight, Pamoli, don't give up. And, you know, it's difficult times, but, you know, we draw upon our cultural resources, our history as a people, and we'll find a way. Oui, bon souhait, merci, bénédiction. Mm -hmm. yes.